Uh, and this is a webinar that we hold once a month as a part of Let's Talk Business. Let's Talk Business is every Wednesday from 12 to 1 Pacific time. And it's always free and it's always different topics. And I'll, I'll have some of our upcoming topics later on in the slide here. Um, a couple housekeeping things before we get started. This is being recorded. So I'm going to email the recording and the slides out to everyone afterwards. So if you wanted to listen to it again, or you're always welcome to share with, with others as well. Please mute yourself in between uh, in between asking questions. This is a pretty small group of us. I think there's about seven of us on, seven or eight. Um, and so we can ask lots of questions. You're always welcome to. I've muted some of you if there was a lot of background noises, but just raise your hand and that'll let me know that you want to talk, or you can use the chat feature, um, which I think is, yeah, this one. So if you have questions, you can either raise your hand, which is this symbol, and it just lets me know that you want to be unmuted uh, or type into the chat box. And if you are having trouble hearing me or, or anybody um, throughout this, it is a little better often to use the phone audio versus the computer audio. Oh, if you're wondering how you mute yourself, there's this green mic here, or under the attendee list, you find your name, and you can mute it next to the green mic. Are there any questions about this before we move on? Okay, so uh, I would love to do some quick introductions, and the, really that's just um, who you are, your business or your business idea, maybe you haven't actually started your business, and then kind of where are you in that business? Are you in the idea stage? Do you have any licensings or permits? Um, or have you made any sales? Would love to know that. And that kind of helps me tailor today's conversation to, to you guys since you're actually here. Um, and if it's okay with everybody, oops, um, I'm just going to, since a lot of you I have muted, I'm just going to go down the list. Um, Andrea Corson, would you like to start? That's okay. How about uh, Christiane? Um, hi. I'm actually not in a location where I can really talk. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. No problem. Yes, if you can't talk, you don't have to. You don't have to. Um, you can either use the chat function and just let me know what your business is, um, or or we can talk about that later. Uh, no problem. How about Gail? Are you able to share with us or Grace? Your Gail is interested in custom embroidery. Great. And are you just kind of in that idea stage right now, um, or have you do you have any customers yet? And how about uh, Grace or Leticia, Rachel or Simone? Does anybody want to? Introduce themselves, Gail. Let's see. You have some customers lined up, but are in the process of investigating business. That's wonderful. So you have some potential customers. Now you just need to lay that framework. That sounds great. Yeah. Sorry about that. I don't know if you can hear me now. This is great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, my business is actually uh, wedding photography, with the uh, hopes to actually do like visual storytelling. Um, so kind of just a weird niche and just looking at getting into it. Great. Thank you. Okay. And I got a message in here. Okay. Let's see. Andrea, you're, you can't talk either. That's okay. You're an LSC or LCSWR who's interested in starting a private practice along with training compliance in behavioral health field. You've done compliance as a consultant. Uh, I don't know what L, uh, LCSW is, but I'm assuming it's some sort of health practitioner, it looks like in the behavioral health. Okay, that's wonderful, starting your own practice. Let's see, Leticia, you work with a child care resource and referral agency and help people start up child care businesses in Idaho. That's wonderful. Um, and Leticia, so a lot of this is for Washington State, um, but we can even talk afterwards and there is a, a similar um, organization like this in, in Idaho too. 
Uh, licensed clinical social work. Okay, wonderful. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, that's wonderful. And so who I am, I'm Tracy Hansen. I'm, I'm with the Washington Center for Women in Business. I'm the program manager of the WCWB. And just a little bit about us. We are funded in part by the U.S. Small Business Administration to be a women's business center. And we help women who either want to start a business or if you're already in business, how can we help you maintain a successful, healthy, sustainable business? And you can see on the screen there just some of the things that we cover. Really, we, we meet you where you want to be. You're the one who provides the goals, the vision, and then we can help, help get you there. And we do this through uh, workshops and webinars like this one, either online or we have in person. We just had this same one here last night in person in Lacey, Washington. Um, so have lots of workshops, but then a lot of what we do is one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. And that's where you would sit down one-on-one -on -one with our business coach, Christine Buckley, and you guys would actually talk about, you know, what it is that you wanted in your startup goal, um, you know, what was your vision, what's your passion, what's driving you, and then Christine would help break that down into manageable milestones and goals and help give you those basic foundational um, needs, uh, you know, and, and information in order for you to actually build that. And when we use the term coaching, um, just kind of to, to clarify that, because I know it's kind of a buzzword, especially right now. Really, what what we define as coaching is a little bit of consulting. You know, they'll look into your business. Um, we don't actually input. We don't do any of the work for you, but we we can uh, dive in and kind of analyze and assess, and then uh, some of the advising. So this is what you could do, or to get you to your goal, here's what we recommend, and then a little bit of an accountability buddy too. You know, especially for women in business. Um, sometimes we need that little bit of push, that little, the sounding board accountability to make sure that you, you take that next step. And one thing I should mention, um, even though we are focused primarily on helping women, we do help if any of you have either uh, male partners or maybe a spouse partner um, uh, or you have a male friend who is starting a business, we're always happy to help those, those clients as well. Um, we do cover the entire state of Washington, but we're located in Lacey, Washington, which is kind of this area here. Uh, the first time you meet with us one-on-one -on -one is free. It's $25 per session after that, and the sessions are about 50 minutes long. But we do have scholarships available. We never want that $25 to be a barrier. So um, contact us if you if you would like that. And you can always come to the free one to to see if you and Christine, you know, um, have a have a good working relationship anyway. Okay, so with all that, so that's a little bit about the Women's Business Center. We will be talking, oh, so today we're going to be talking in generalities, a lot of it, you know, what applies to most businesses. I'll try to tailor it as much as possible based on the information that you guys gave me. Um, but just know that none of this has to be done by yourself. So I will give you some resources at the end where you can look up a lot of additional information to get more or we'll kind of point you in the direction. But any of these things can also be worked on with a business coach. And if you are outside of Washington, um, the Women's Business Centers are a nationwide um, nationwide network. So, so you can work with anybody. So today we're really going to be talking about um, what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur, uh, and business feasibility. So what questions do you need to ask yourself to know that your business will be successful? And then we'll talk about just some of the elements of the business plan and then financing options for startup businesses as they pertain to you guys. And then, uh, like I said, some, some resources that can help you further your goal here. So this little Venn diagram, uh, we, you know, we're, we're a nerdy bunch here, so we love Venn diagrams. These are the three main pieces that we'll be talking about today. Um, the personal assessment, the market assessment, and the financial assessment. And really, these if these all come together, if you're able to say, okay, these all three seem feasible, we, that's what we think would you have a really high likelihood of success then. Um, if some of these, 
you know, you're able to answer the questions and it turns out that it's not feasible, that doesn't mean that the business idea in general isn't feasible, but just maybe that you need to do some tweaking. Um, maybe you need to, there's things that you didn't think about, maybe more research to be done. Um, but we love, we, I mean, there's, and, and I guess I should back up a second, the market assessment and the financial assessment, those are pieces that would go directly into your business plan. And regardless if you're going to ask for outside funding from a lender or a financial institution, um, there's great value to be had in this business planning. And there's really a big difference between writing a business plan and doing business planning. Regardless if you need to write a business plan, a formal one for financing, it's so crucial to do that business planning because a, a lot of studies will sh show a huge correlation between doing that business planning and success because you think about all the little things that you don't want to think about when you're, um, when you're in it, when you're running it. First of all, you'll be busy running the business. Um, if you didn't, you know, there will always be something that you didn't plan for. But, you know, if you can address as many of those things beforehand, you can plan for it, you can save for it, yada, yada. So anyway, we'll be going, we'll be going through this here. So kind of that first piece is the, the personal assessment. So you've decided you want to be an entrepreneur, at least you're exploring it. Um, and most people go into business ownership because of the four C's, um, either all four of them or a combination of them. You know, control, you want to be your own boss, challenge, you know, mentally, physically, you want to do something new. We're happy when we're expanding our minds. Um, many, many entrepreneurs have a, the, the creativity, and, and we're not even talking necessarily about, you know, putting paint on a canvas, right? Creativity on problem solving, creative uh, solutions to things, and, and really putting that to work and not being in the confines of somebody else's business. And then, of course, you're all in it to make money, hopefully, anyway, that's the, that's the goal is to get that cash. Um, so really, you want to think about, even if your business idea is the most feasible one ever, if you personally aren't necessarily suited to be an entrepreneur, you know, what can you do to uh, to help yourself with that? So can you be self-reflective? Can you can you or can you think about what you what you can do, what your skill gaps are now um, and then do the research that that can fill any of those gaps. And let me tell you one thing right now. There is nothing wrong with having a skill gap. So you want to be, um, you know, you're you're doing custom embroidery, but you don't know anything about a business. That is okay because most people start businesses because they're passionate about that thing that they want to do, um, whether it's the social working or the embroidery or, you know, telling those stories. Um, those are That's what you want to do. So how can we help fill that with, okay, well, now here's what you, you need to be a sole proprietor or a LLC or, yeah, you know, all that kind of fun stuff, but you're not in it alone. Um, what makes it, you know, and so not only do you need to be ready, but help find that, that right business plan. Um, and it sounds like a lot of you are really going down the, the right path. You know, what are your interests and passions and also, you know, what you are, um, you know, trained to do, you know, we, we all want to work at something that we love doing every day. And that'll help the hard things about business will help if you, if you love what you're doing. Um, and then what's your expertise? So um, obviously, Andrea, you're, you know, you're the LCSW. So you're trained in that. And, and um, you're able to actually, you know, legal practice, legally practice that. Um, is it feasible in this market? So, and we'll talk more about the market assessment in a minute here, but what questions do you need to ask yourself to make sure that that, that business will work in, where, in how you want to open it and kind of what the outlook for the industry is? And then can you afford it? A lot of small businesses are started out of savings accounts um, or maybe you work part-time while you're also um, having your business part-time. Perhaps you have friends and family fund, and we'll talk more about funding funding stuff in, in a minute here. Um, 
but that's really important. All those pieces need to come together in order for you to, to have business success. So why build a business plan? Like I said, it's not even about building the business plan. It's about doing the business planning because really this is going to be your guide. Um, it's making sure that you're covering all your bases. You're thinking about, okay, what do I need? What happens when this happens? Um, you know, what equipment do I need to buy? Who are my customers going to be? And that way, if you don't have the answer to a question, you have the time to figure it out so that if you need to pivot your vision, your business vision, uh, it's not really costly either with your time or your money to do that. Um, ensure that you're financially and, and otherwise prepared. That's a big thing. We, you know, we have a big emphasis on the financials and the cash flow planning. And I, does anybody um, on the test, and you're welcome to to type it in. Are any of you really good at at the bookkeeping, at the financial? Have you had experience doing QuickBooks or another thing or another system, um, payroll, cash flow estimates, anything like that? That's okay. Most businesses don't. You know, a CPA, for instance, is going to start, it don't usually start their own businesses because they're risk adverse. They want to go work for somebody else, right? You've been in corporate finance for, oh, 20 years. That's wonderful. Um, so you have that really good financial um, foundation, which is going to come in so handy. That's wonderful to hear, Gail. Um, so just making sure that you're you're prepared for all of those. And then you have maybe a little bit of slush, too, to to make up for those, you know, things that you didn't plan for. And then, you know, you want to make sure that you are directing your future, meaning if you have it in the plan of what you're going to do when you expand, what you're going to do when you have a certain number of, number of customers, what you want your three, five, ten-year goal to be, you are steering the, the future of this business. Otherwise, if you don't have a plan, your customers might you might be the one in the driver's seat and while I think a lot of business owners would say well they're my customers of course are what drive me you know they're they're the ones that get feedback and that's not saying that if a customer is telling you that they love certain products or hate certain products or services that you don't listen to that and and incorporate that but but you still want to be in control of of how their feedback is being implemented into your business and how you're going to deal with that feedback um, or their their wants and desires. They're not going to be the one doing that for you. So on QuickBooks, you have QuickBooks experience. That's great. Great. That's going to be important. So what makes a good business plan? Um, it needs to be comprehensive. It needs to cover all the areas. And we've seen this time and time again, you know, maybe, you know, for Simone and, and for Gail, if you have the financial uh, background, maybe you have the financial pieces covered, uh, but you have no idea about marketing. And so you just kind of skim over that or do some quick bullet points. But the ones that you're uncomfortable with are almost the most important that you need to address. Um, and if you don't know how to how to address those pieces of the business plan, that's okay. You can either come to a resource like the Women's Business Center. There are so many templates online and examples online, especially your local libraries is a great resource for small business um, business plan templates. Never copy somebody else's business plan um, exactly, even if even if you want to start the exact same business. The owner is different. Where they're locating it, it might be different. You know, there's always going to be things that you need to customize. And by copying and pasting somebody else's business plan into a Word document and, and putting your own name on it, is that really doing the business planning? No. If you, if you haven't read every word and constructed it and thought about every single one of those pieces, it's again, it's, it's something pretty to put on a shelf. It's not something that's actually going to guide you through your business. You want to do good and relevant research. Um, and what we really mean by relevant, um, you know, so you want to do some market research about about your industry in general. But we actually had this one client a, a ways back uh, who wanted to open a, a coffee stand. And their business, their business plan was like 
30, 40 pages long, and a lot of it was pages and pages and pages about research that they've done on international co coffee industry, about espresso stands all over the world. But they just wanted to open one espresso stand, a coffee stand in their local town. And while I think it's important that they know they have their pulse on on the industry, you know, your plan doesn't need to include that. You know, what is it about your community that's important? Um, you know, do you have, you know, the location, the what makes you, maybe maybe if the the nationwide, the worldwide industry of coffee, let's say something was going to happen and prices would change because of that, maybe that would be good and relevant information to put in there. But just the history of the coffee bean and things like that, not important, right? Um, so just make sure that you're not going down a rabbit hole um, with the with the research. You want to make sure that it's relevant to the business plan. Um, you want to make sure it's realistic um, in your plan, and that can be maybe your sales projections. Um, depending on what type of business it is, you know, some businesses have might have lots of sales right away, especially if they have a physical location. If there's a retail store that's it's located somewhere and, and people will be able to get foot traffic in there. Or maybe you have an online store that, you know, is selling something and you're doing a lot of advertising and marketing and that sort of thing. Maybe you have sales right away. But if it's a relationship type business, you have to build relationships with your customers. Maybe you're some sort of consultant or potentially um, your social work there. I don't know if you have to build the the relationships with the doctors or the referral i'm not sure how you're getting clients if it's through referrals or if it'd be people calling you um, but that might take m take months for for those relationship based businesses to to get going on sales and that's okay there's nothing wrong with that but you have to plan for it uh especially in the cash flow and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, which really kind of goes into the contains supportable financial protection projection so um, how did you come up with those projections? Are they realistic? Um, you, you know, you don't want to be too scared and, and go under, you know, under project because especially if you're looking for money, you want to make sure that, um, you know, that you'll be showing sales, but you don't want to be so optimistic that it's showing that you're breaking even on the first, the first month. It's so common for businesses to run in the red for several months. I mean, Amazon, for instance, and not that, you know, anybody's starting at Amazon, but they were in the red for 10 years before they before they got in the black. Um, you know, that that hopefully won't be none of you will be 10 years, but it, it could be six months. It could be a year, definitely. And running in the red isn't bad if you plan for it. And we'll talk about that later. And then again, you want to have it'll lay out your action plan and those goals of not only when you start the business, but then let's look at three years, five years, 10 years down the road. So what needs to be covered? These are the pieces of the business plan. Not only will you have the description and the structure of your business, which we'll talk about on the next slide, um, but the market analysis, your marketing plan, how, you, how are you gonna get the customer's operations plan, um, who are the owners, who, how are you gonna hire people, uh, financial plan, how do you plan on staying afloat during that time? Um, is Are there any questions before we continue on? You guys are a pretty quiet bunch. Okay, no problem. So your business structure. Um, there are four main kinds of business structure. Sole proprietorship would be if you and your business are one and the same. Um, so there's no legal separation between, you know, Tracy Hansen and Tracy Hansen's, uh, I don't know, a CPA firm, um, if I was a sole proprietor. If you were going to be probably, depending on the liability, I'm trying to think of who, you know, maybe for like the custom embroidery, depending on if you're going to have... Um, uh, many employees, sole proprietor, if it's just going to be you, that might be a great thing um, because if you just send, you know, I don't know if it'll be like pillows and and um, uh, like dish towels or if you're thinking like t-shirts and stuff, likely somebody's going to not going to wear your product and get hurt, right? Whereas um, 
some of the other the other companies, especially like you know Andrea with your um, uh, with the social work and uh, let's see if there needs to be kind of a more protection and a separation between you as as the business owner and the business itself. Limited liability companies or LLCs and corporations are definitely the most common forms. It means they're structurally separate. Now, this doesn't replace your need for business insurance. All businesses should get business insurance, and, and that kind of depends on your industry and, and the level of, of um, liability that you're open up to. Um, but at least that means so in an LLC or a corporation, let's say uh, you get sued, well, they can't come after your personal stuff in order to pay off that, that lawsuit unless they can show that there, there's not really a big separation. Um, when you're forming an LLC, you have to, you have to do things like um, filing an operating agreement with a corporation, you need bylaws. And sometimes those things can feel really silly. If you're the only person, you're the only owner, and you're the only employee. Um, but it's so important that you that you do that and you don't let your personal finances and, and other things mix. Because let's say you are sued, you know, you're you're being tried in fire. You're the the people aren't testing this unless they're trying to get at you. And if they can see a bridge between your business and your personal, they'll use that bridge and try to take your your personal stuff. And what I mean by that is let's say um you need money for some sort of personal thing. You know, you're you're paying your mortgage and um you want to take money out of the business, but instead you maybe somebody gives you a check and you just insert that right into your personal account so that you can pay your mortgage. Well, what you should have done was inserted it into or deposited it into the personal or I'm sorry, the business account and then taken an ownership draw from that, which would be a payout because then you can do that's your personal money and you can do with that what you will. Um, and that keeps the separation. But by by putting a, a business related check into your personal, you have now incorporated the two. Even though you can say, well, wait a minute, I have, I'm have, i an LLC, I'm a corporation. The lawyer won't care <laughs> in that situation. Um, and the reason partnership is up there, but it's also cross out, oh, let's see, does the LLC have to be renewed annually? Um, no, once you have the that operating agreement um, in place, it does not. You do have to, you, you don't file the operating agreement anywhere, but you have to have it. Um, great question. So um, the part reason partnerships um, are there but but cross out is because and <laughs> this is in the, a direct quote from my my mentor the person who who taught me everything I know is that they're stupid. <laughs> um, they are really so what a general partnership would be would be you know two of you that are starting a business um, and you are actually each liable for each other's dealings. So it'd be almost like a sole proprietorship, but with two people um, or more people. It, it can be more than two people. And so that means if let's say um, let's say Grace and I are, are starting a business together and I'm signing up for contracts and she's going, hey, wait, that's, you know, th that doesn't seem right. And I'm signing contracts anyway. And then um, and she, Grace has got the, the big pockets over there. And so now we're being sued on something that we couldn't deliver on or something. Well, I signed the contract. I don't have any money. Grace does. She's the one paying out because now we are the same person legally um, in the in the eyes of, of the law. So really, there's so few reasons. To, maybe a husband and wife, a wife, or I guess two spouses could be a partnership. But honestly, in Washington State anyway, in any community property state, Spouses can also be a sole proprietor, um, even though there's two people. Grace uh, asked, can you go from sole proprietorship to LLC? Absolutely. Yeah, so sole proprietor is basically saying you're just the one person. So, yes, you can always start an LLC. And that's a great idea if you want to um, protect yourself from, from any liability. And really, you want to think about a, a number of different things while you're deciding that. Not everything, just because most people are an LLC or corporation and because 
sole proprietors have some more liable, it doesn't mean that either one is better or worse for you. It really depends on what business you're starting, what what you what your situation is in the industry. Um, it'll depend on the number of owners. Is it just you? Um, is it multiple owners? If it is um, multiple owners and they're not married, sole proprietorship is out. It can only be um, one person or a married couple in a in a community property state like Washington. Um, there's liability concerns, like I said, if you have something that could potentially, um, you know, hurt somebody or, you know, I mean, there's always a potential to sue. This is America, right? But um, you, you might want to try the LLC. Um, corporation is usually not, not necessarily the most common for small businesses unless you, for you see yourself having hundreds of owners one day. Um, they're a little bit more complicated. Um, if you wanted to have the shareholders, you can change that later. Um, but probably the most common with small businesses are sole proprietor and, and LLC. Um, and when you're coming up with those um, uh, operating agreement and bylaws, it's great to have an attorney look at those, but you definitely don't need it. There are a lot of templates online. We have templates, and again, your local library likely does too. Um, and there are there are also tax implications. State, state taxes, at least for Washington, are the same regardless of the business type you choose, but there can be some differences in, in federal taxes. Um, and I won't, I'm, this could be an entire class on, <laughs> on itself. I won't spend any more time on that. Um, but this would be a great thing to talk about with a coach, um, or I'll send you a link later that has some great resources and trying to figure out which is best for you and, and asking you these questions. So let's move on to the market analysis. Um, so what need does your product or service address? So that really is what your business is all about, right? What need does you, what is your business addressing? Is anybody willing to share um, the market need they think that their business is, is addressing? And need can be a tricky word because not only, you know, we think of needs as, okay, water, shelter, um, food, those kinds of things, you know, none of your, you know, it's not necessarily something that a human being needs to live, but a need in the marketplace could also be, well, I'm, is there something to spend the money on? Is it something that I would use? Is it something that people would spend money on? And maybe not everybody, um, but your target population, uh, which is so important. So your target population is, um, is kind of your, or we, we, we use often the term persona. Likely for your business, you're going to have a persona uh, that you are going to try to market to. And the persona is your most likely customer. Your most likely customer to buy, to buy at the price point, and to buy repeatedly um, from you so that you can, you know, make a living. And you want to think about this person. Oh, okay, let's see, Andrea. You had said, so this goes back to your product service. Um, individuals with substance use, mental health needs, yes, absolutely, for training, compliance, drug treatment, and mental. Oh, so you'd have two, one for the individuals and then one for the providers. That's great. This correlates very well into this, this persona. You can a, per, a business can have one. They can have multiple uh, likely small businesses don't need more than, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten. That that gets a little lot. Um, as you become an established business, you might realize that there are more personas that you want to market to, which is fine. Uh, but definitely don't overwhelm yourself. And uh, Andrea did, is it Andrea or Andrea? Um, did a great job. She actually picked two out. So individuals with substance use or mental health needs. And what you would look for, you'd want to get even more specific. Um, so what what is the most likely gender? Um, and likely for yours, um, that, that might be both. Um, what are the age range? What are um, their income level? What, um, you know, that sort of thing. So then you can say, because you don't want to say, well, everybody needs mental health. 
um, help, even though we do. <laughs> well, I, I firmly believe in, in mental health. But, um, but who are going to be the most likely? And that will depend on your business structure because, I, you know, without talking to you further, I don't know if this will be people will be paying it for themselves. Will you be billing insurances? You know, all those kinds of questions. But so who are these people? Because um, when you are doing the marketing, if you're marketing to everybody like, hey, everybody who ever needs any mental health or substance abuse things, um, come and see me because I can help you. Well, if I see that and I'm thinking, well, I could use a counselor, but I've never had any substance use problems. So maybe Andrea isn't the best person for me because I'm thinking I want somebody that's perfect for me, not somebody who caters to everybody. If you're trying to market to everyone, it means that you're marketing to no one. Um, be specific and not saying that, let's say, you know, I come in the door and I want your service, not saying that you'll turn me away, but that I might not be that key, key demographic for you. Um, and then on the other hand, you have another avatar. So in that first one, Andrea, you might have two or more just in the individuals, right? You might have um, one that's like a, a young male. You might have an older female or, or whatever it is um, with income levels of X, Y, Z. And then in that second bracket, you have those mental health providers. And that's so key. And so many of you might want to think about not only could it be people buying from you, but it could be other businesses, institutions, um, government agencies, and you want to treat them separately because trust, I actually came, the, before I was with the Women's Business Center, I was with a program dedicated to help small business with government contracts, and the government does not like being marketed to the same way that you market to, you know, Joe and Sally down the street. So um, if, if an industry... <coughs> excuse me, an, an institution or a government agency or a business is one of your your personas, you need to market accordingly. Let's see, we got something else here. Um, Gail, oh, so your, your um, need that you address is advertising logos on hat shirts. Great. Oh, great, yeah, so all those milestone memorabilia, yes, wonderful. There are so many of those in there. I, I mean, I feel like customized gifts now are such such a high trend. Um, great. People getting married or other momentous occasions, something to capture that specific moment at that time. Yes. With the photography. Yep. And with Grace, it's, it's going to be all about the experience, right? They're not just buying the photos. It's capturing that experience on that momentous occasion. Exactly. Um. Gail, your target population, clubs, boating, bowling, fire department, sports, great. Yeah. So, again, so you just picked out um, a bunch of, like, institutions, organizations. So you'll need to think about those a little differently than the people as far as, okay, what does the club or fire department care about? What are their budgetary needs and restrictions? Um, who is the person Doing the buying, kind of when you're when you're selling to an institution or a government, you might have not only the organization as well, but then you are dealing with a person. You have the person in the purchasing department, right, that you have to um, cater to a little bit as well. Great. Um, Andrea, sliding scale to begin with, uh, as it takes a long time to get insurance panels, I'm sure. Mental health, specialty, parenting, divorce kids. That's great. The fact that you even just use the word specialty, you know, I think all small businesses should kind of think of themselves in that that medical practitioner way of the specialty. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with those general practitioners, but the specialty, again, makes you special to me as a buyer. Um, that's wonderful. Okay, Christian, people with a sweet tooth, yes, living or working in Seattle and opening to try new food trends. Yes. Um, and we were just talking about in last night's class, food is actually one of the biggest reasons people travel nowadays. They they travel to find that sweet or savory or different thing um, that they can't get at home, right? That is the experience is, is eating it. And, of course, in the days of social media, we want to take a picture and share it and Snapchat and Instagram it and all that kind of fun stuff, too. So it, it's got to be visually appealing. Wonderful. Yeah, you guys 
did great. Um, yeah, so be thinking about um, that need and how that, that target population is. Um, and then when you have that target population, is there a demand or can you create one? Um, and what you can do, there's a lot of great demographics that you can look up. Um, if you, I, I don't know where everybody's located, um, but the, the library system in uh, Puget Sound, Washington area that we're in, has something called Reference USA that has a lot of demographic information. Christian, I know that the Seattle Library does as well, but I, I can't remember if theirs is called the same thing. If um, you can always go into your local library and ask to access US, Reference USA, if you're on the call or if you work with Christine or myself, um, we can help access it. We have accounts to that as well. If your library doesn't, ask them if they have some sort of market research demographics, I bet they do. Um, because then you can say, okay, so now I've identified that my um, perfect customer for my, so let's say that we're Christian and you have that suite too. So you want people that are within a, a certain radius that are, let's say yours is, uh, you know, 35 women from 35 to 55, I'll just throw that out there. And they have to have an income of, of uh, 45,000 at least to, ha to be able to enjoy your, your delectable treats. Well, you're able to punch those numbers in and it'll tell you, okay, Christian, there's only seven people that meet that requirement. Obviously that's not true, especially in Seattle. Uh, but you'd say, oh shoot, well, let me think about this again. Or maybe it's, um, a much higher number and you say, okay, so I have, I have, look at all of these people that meet that persona that is likely going to be my high, my high seller, my high customer. That's wonderful. Um, you can also look on those sites for other demographics for like competitors in the area. Um, it's so important to know your competition because not only will you, um, you'll be competing with them. Uh, yeah, as well as the the head to head people. So, Christian, remind me. I don't remember what sweet thing you were making. Um, not only will you have the people that might do the exact same thing, but there might be substitutions. Um, for instance, I'm not sure what what Christian does, but let's say um, you know, their whatever her sweet treat is, let small cookies. Okay. Um. So maybe instead of cookies, there's a brownie shop down the street, or there's an ice cream parlor, or there's some gelato. Um, so so you have people's preferences, there's other options. Um, or maybe there's another small cookie company that has a family recipe on the same area of the neighborhood. That might not be the best place to go in to start your business. So, I mean, it's never a smart thing to go head to head with a competition, whether they're the big guys like Walmarts and Targets, um, they're the medium sized established business, or even if it's another small business, because people are, you know, we're creatures of habit. I always go to Joe Blow's Bakery. Um, so what is it about your cookies that makes me, why should I deviate from my normal natural routine? Um and if it's the same thing, let's say they're just, um, maybe they're an everything um, sweet store. Maybe, okay, well, you have this awesome French family recipe. Well, that's going to be enough for me. I think that's great. You want to make sure you have that uniqueness over your competition. Otherwise, you're going to get lost in the masses. Um, so what is it that, well, that makes your business unique? And that could be... Um, the actual product or service that you provide. It could be a twist on a favorite. It could be a different way of doing it. It could be um, sourcing locally or organic or sustainable um, sources. So there's a lot of ways that you can make yourself unique that might um, turn or turn customers away from competition and to you. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, this is a great time to talk about pricing because um, I just mentioned, you know, you might be competing with the Walmarts and the um, the Targets out there, Amazon, you know, gosh, all small businesses have to, 
um, compete with online online delivery nowadays. And pricing is so important. And this is something that women especially, we typically, as women business owners, realize only about a quarter of the profits as their male-owned counterpart in the same industry, as well as about a quarter of the access to capital. And some of that, you know, there's lots of research on what that is, but some of that is pricing. You know, women, we start businesses because we're passionate about what we do, um, and we want to make sure that we are helping as much as possible. But the truth is, is if you're not priced so that you can be sustainable, you won't be able to help very many people if you go out of business right? So um, you are not a bad person for making money. You're not a bad person for not giving discounts. You're not a bad person um, for pricing so that you can not only cover the cost of the supplies, your time, overhead. Um, you know, as a small business owner, you're also thinking about retirement. So in X amount of years, you, I mean, you don't want to work until you're on your deathbed, right? So how how can you be putting some away for for your retirement? Uh, Leticia, hardest part to figure out. It is. And, and really you can start by, okay, what does it cost? How much time does it cost? And then you want to look at other places in the industry, but really quickly, you don't want to necessarily go based off like, okay, well, my competitor is at $19.99, so I'm going to come in under them at $18.99. You never want to play the my price is lower game because a small business will always lose, especially new businesses. Um, again, you want to make sure that you're unique enough and that you have the, the offering that people want and that your target customer can afford the stuff that you're selling at the price that you're selling it at. So, for example here, um, let's say so the Walmarts of the world, Walmart, Target, yada, yada, they can buy at stuff at a low margin, so they're only making a little bit on each product, but they buy huge amounts. They can buy so much. They have the economies of scale, so they can actually make this work, and they make money on, on making just a little bit on every single product because they're selling billions every second. Um, then if you have the low margin and the low volume, which most small businesses are kind of in this low volume, you're not going to be selling thousands of things a day thousands of appointments, thousands of um, embroidery, that sort of thing. Um, so if you try to price yourself low, uh, that's almost instant death. Do, don't, don't undercut. You know, if there is, yes, Leticia, it's a good point not to undercut. You know, if there's, a, if there's a really valid reason that you can offer a low price, maybe your supplier is cheaper, maybe, you know, whatever you do it, then, then sure, maybe that's a, that's a good business reason but don't do it just to try to get on the competition. Now, this is where everybody would love to be. These are gold bars, if you can't tell by the picture. That's where you have a high volume, so you're selling a bunch, and you also have high margin. Um, this is gold, <laughs> this is very rare. This is like pharmaceutical companies um, that have you know patents on things and are selling large quantities and, and that sort of thing. That would be great to be there, most small businesses aren't there, at least not for a long, 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 long while. Um, so this is kind of where you want to aim for. This is so this is not target the store. This is your small business target. So your volume will be relatively low, but you want to be high margin, again, so that you can um, come up with, with not only the money to keep making it, but you want to prepare for your future. And, okay, so um, going back to um, your first statement, Leticia, so... Um, pricing is hard. Um, yes, this is something that I highly recommend. If not the Women's Business Center, talk to a small business development center, score somebody. You don't have to figure this out alone. You can also um, research what – you can still look at what other people are, are pricing that things are. Don't base your decision solely on that. Um, you can also, if you know anybody in that target market, let's say it is, you know, 35-year-old women and you know that, you can even ask them, like, hey, I need your honest opinion. Is this too much? How do you feel? You know, you can do some of your own research, but a lot of that needs to be driven by numbers, um, and, a, and a business coach or a business advisor is a great person to, to help you with that. Um, so your marketing plan, so how will you reach your market? And this is 
so important. This is why your personas are important. So how are you going to reach your market? It depends on who your target customer is, right? So if your target customer is a 65-year-old woman, um, she might be on Facebook, right? We have a lot of women uh, that age and older uh, do a lot on Facebook these days. Um, maybe you have uh, your key demographic is an 18-year-old girl. Well, Facebook, not so much. You need to be on Instagram, Musical.ly, so, um, Snapchat maybe, um, those kinds of things. You need to be advertising in the right, um, you know, if you put an ad in the newspaper, hopefully your customers read the newspaper. Um, if you put an ad on Craigslist, hopefully your customers read. So who are your customers? Where do they go? Um, are they outdoors people? Do they subscribe to those type of magazines? Is there ad space there? Um, you can also, to re-engage existing customers, you know, have a sign-up sheet to have a newsletter so that you can email them about sales. Because if they bought from you once, they're a pretty good likelihood to buy from you again, right? As long as they're happy from your, with your product or service. Um, so then think about what marketing activities you'll do. And again, that could be social media um, advertising. It could be print ads. Um, maybe you're in those value pack or, or things that come in the mail. Um, or postcards, you know, they're saying now that um, mail advertising is an M A I L <laughs> advertising, not M A L E, is going is an uptrend because we get so many spam emails every day that people don't even open them anymore. So at least if it comes in your mailbox, you you see it and you read it. I thought that was really interesting. They thought that print was going to die, but now it's just coming back around in a loop. So what marketing activities will you do, um, what advertising will you do, and when will you do them? It's going to be really important, especially if you're a seasonal business. You know, when can, are, are you doing a holiday push? Are you having a seasonal sale? Um, uh, is there, you know, for you, Andrea, maybe you have an enrollment period, um, or maybe there's a, a time, there are certain classes that get over, um, that deal with substance abuse or mental health abuse, then you can advertise towards the end of those those classes so that you can get those people one-on-one -on -one or, or something. Be thinking about what else other than social media or, or than a flyer on, you know, on a tree can you do? And then how much do those cost? You know, social media really isn't that expensive a lot of times to do those paid advertisements. Um, if you hone in on your chart, because on Facebook, I don't know if anybody's done a Facebook advertisement. We do often for our program. And I can say, I usually do women from, you know, 18 to 60 in Washington State. I usually don't do the income because I think, um, you know, I, I do want to re <laughs> reach more people. I'm not always practice what I preach. But I do market to women. Does that mean that men don't come, men come to these? Of course they do. And I'm always happy to have them. Um, but I target it towards the women, and I only pay to advertise to women. Um, so make sure that you are know the cost of those so that you can put that in your cash flow, which we'll get to in a minute here. Um, next is the operations plan. So again, this is a piece of the business plan, and this is where you want to look at the location of your business. Um, is that a good location? Uh, do you know what the best way to find out what the business best location if you're thinking about moving into a certain place you know what you can do is actually stand on the corner or sit in your car and watch how many customers come by um, if you're in a shopping mall for instance how many customers come down to that end count them write them down um, you know so that way you can see how many cars drive by if it's a coffee stand how many you know xyz that that happens that might result in a business. Now, some of you, for instance, Andrea, you know, people will likely come to your office. It's not really, you're not really like a walk-in and, and hey, I need some, although maybe you have walk-ins, I don't know. Um, so location, not that location isn't important, but you obviously don't need to be on a high traffic location. You just need to be easily accessible. Um, you also need to think about uh, your legal needs, insurance needs. So. Um, you can get product insurance, liability insurances, um, you know, it can be licensing. So depending on what your business is and your industry is, you might have different insurance needs. And we highly recommend everybody have, have insurance needs. 
Um, and then it's really important to know the regular re regulatory requirements so that you can follow them. You can't follow the regulations if you don't know them, right? And I'll give you a link here in a minute that will show you where to get those. Uh, Andrea says, private practice in your office, but compliance training can be done at other locations. Yeah, so you can go to where the providers are. So that could be, and I don't know if that's a common in that industry or not, um, probably if it's compl compliance and training, but that could maybe be a unique thing. If not, okay, yes, it is common, great. Um, so let's see, then you also need to think about staffing. So are you, um, a lot of businesses start with only the owner, that's fine. Um, how long are you gonna be able to sustain that? How often will you need to hire somebody? How much will those people cost? How much, how long is it gonna take to train them? How much is it gonna take to train them? Um, and, and if it's any like retail type things, plan for turnover, unfortunately. You know, turnover happens um, and it takes time to train a new person. So, so you, wanna, you wanna plan that money and that time cost effectively. Um, equipment and supply needs. So, you know, besides the computer and printer, uh, what else do you need? If, like for the baker, you know, you're baking those cookies, what do you need? Um, what are the, are there any special equipment? Do you need to have somebody move them in? Do they need to be hooked up? Do they need special, special hookups? Does that cost money? Um, you want to make sure that you are always keeping great records and you have um, good accounting functions. QuickBooks is really common. There are other ones out there as well, um, depending on what you need, um, like Peachtree and, oh gosh, there's a, there's a handful of really good ones. So um, find one that meets your needs for your business structure. You'll want to have like your business structure and a little bit of a plan in place before you can pick out your, your accounting system. Um, and then figure out management. This might not be a big deal if you're the only person. Well, great, you're the employee and the manager. Um, but if you are going to have employees, especially several employees, who reports to who, whose functions are what, if you have multiple owners, whose functions are what, um, who's in charge of what, who owns what, that way there's no, um, no issues later. And then kind of a description of the, the operation. And it's important to have the advisor. So not only people like Christine and I and other resource programs like this, but it could be somebody that's also in the industry, a mentor that you've had a long time. Advisors come in all shapes and sizes. Um, so, so just making sure that, that they're on board and that you're planning for them. And I know we're running short. Um, if you are, we're running a touch long here. I'll finish up quickly. If you have to leave, don't worry. I will um, send out the recording to you. But if you're able to stay on, feel free to, and I'll finish this up, okay? Um, Gail, how do you go about connecting with a mentor advisor? That's such a good question. Um, we get it all the time. So an advisor could be somebody like here at the Women's Business Center where you just sign up for an appointment and and you can do that. There's also the Small Business Development Center, SCORE. Um, if you're a veteran, there's a Veterans Outreach um, Program. Um, to find a mentor then, um, it can be a little trickier. There are some women's groups that have them, you know, going to networking events, things like that would be a great place to find it. But it's honestly kind of, it's not, there's unfortunately not a roster of people like, hey, I'm looking for a mentee. Um, that would be so nice, but it doesn't exist. You have to kind of build relationships with people and see, okay, who can I um, learn from? Who who has something to teach me? And then look for women who that you want to be when you grow up kind of thing. Like, man, their business, whether it's in the same industry or not, man, their business is flying and they're only been open for, you know, seven years and that's who, where I want to be in that amount of time. Pick their brain. See if they're willing to to um, give you some time. And really, even if it's in the same industry, we've had so many instances where people were maybe afraid to talk to them because they were in the same industry and they didn't want to sound like they were selling industry secrets. But women are usually there to help you. Like, let me give you, the, especially if we're not starting the same business or we're not in the same location, let me tell you what I've known so that you don't have to go through all the hardships that I've gone through. Um, so uh, honestly, going to, going to those kinds of meetings. The advisor is a little bit easier because there are programs that you can, can sign up for. 
Uh, I think I missed a question here. If you're a sole proprietor, can you have a spouse work without having them be an employee? Yes. That's the only way that you, that a um, that 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 can happen is if the spouse. Be, uh, well, I guess Grace, are you in Washington State? I'm going to assume you're in Washington until you tell me otherwise. In Washington State, since we're a community property state, he wouldn't be um, an employee; he would be a car owner. But that's but that is where, okay, so you're not currently. So if you do set up the business where you currently are, whatever state you are in, if it's a community property state, likely they will be able to be co-owner even though you're a sole proprietor. In Washington, that's definitely the case. And that would be great to do because if you added him as an employee, every time you add an employee, there's like 16 forms you now have to sign up or fill out. Um, so, so yes, the answer to your question, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. So financing plan. Um, so what you're going to want to do to start out is, so you've been thinking about all the equipment, you, you've been thinking about your startup and your plan. Now you need to have a detailed list of those startup expenses. And so that's not only things like, um, again, your computer, your printer, um, your website, your business cards, office supplies, good stuff like that, but your start, your total startup costs need to be not only that those lists of startup expenses, but then also when you look at your cash flow projections month to month, um, how long are you running in the deficit? You need to have those startup that startup money for the expenses as well as enough to cover while before you're in the black. And I'll show you an example here in just a minute. Um, and when you're doing that cash flow projection, you want to do not only the amount of money that you're projecting, but the timing. So, you know, if you're a retail business or something that's going to be affected by the holidays, maybe you have higher projections in, in the months leading up to that. Um, uh, or, you know, if there is a bigger enrollment, for instance, um, for you, Andrea, after like the, the health insurance enrollment, you know, then all of a sudden you have new kind. You know, I don't know if that's how it goes in that industry. Um, so then you can kind of plan for that. And let me show you what I mean. So this crazy, crazy thing here. And I'll be emailing this out to you so, so you don't have to write this all down like crazy. Um, so this first line, these are kind of all, these green ones are the startup expenses. So um, COGS is cost of goods sold. So, you know, she, this, this business, I guess, is nightwear, um, had to buy $27,000 of, of inventory. Then they did some marketing and advertising. They had to buy a bunch of equipment and, of course, their insurance, um, other fees, their rent, yada, yada, yada. Um, so all said and done, their startup costs are $76,000. Now, um, so they start up, and it looks like they start in January of 2019, um, or that's where they're planning on starting, and they've made $3,000 in sales. Um, that's what they're projecting this first month. So after they have their projected sales, and then also their expenses. So again, we have inventory, there's marketing, um, payroll. So this person is hiring hiring employees um, all the way down. Um, their loan payments, that's super important. And so when you come all the way down, their cash position at the end of the month is a negative $1,200. Um, and then if you look, so it gets, they get more negative, 1,900, 12,000, 19,000, $20,000 negative, which again, this isn't bad if, so this, since this is the worst, what they need to do in order to be able to know that they can start up and be sustainable, they need to have this 76089 plus 2700, because then that'll cover their largest deficit. Because then you can see they're projecting to kind of grow out of, and finally in August, they're having their first positive month with a, a whopping $130. Um, so, so 76 plus about 20, and you don't want to have that exact amount. You want to have a little bit of slush because something unforeseen is going to happen. Um, so this person, as they're projected, 
they need to have about 100000 in startup money. Uh, hold on, I see we have a question here. For tax purposes, can you declare startup expenses, including research costs, as such before you act? Yes. So even if it's before you have your permit and things like that, that can all count. Yes, great question. Um, and in this, so really, this is all it is. And, and you don't have to come up with this spreadsheet out of your head. We have templates. There are templates you can find online. And for this one, it has multiple, um, and this is kind of like your brain dump, like, okay, this is what I think, and these all tie into other spreadsheets. So like this pink one, or what, what am I gonna go with? The orange one, advertising and marketing. We can see uh, if we go here, so this is the more detail. In January, they're gonna spend $5,000 on advertising their grand opening. And then it's a little bit of smaller February, but then look, they're going to a trade show. That's going to be more. But if you see, so 51, 70, 70, 55, 20, if we go back, that matches these numbers right here. So these, the yellow, the orange, the pink, and the green all feed in from other spreadsheets. And that isn't to scare you and saying, okay, now you have to be an Excel master as well as, as well as a business owner. No, we have these templates. But you need to think about all these things and have these so that you can plan for that. Because if it turns out that, you're going to need $100,000 and you have $3,000 saved up in the bank and you don't have any friends and family that can loan you, maybe you need to keep saving, right? Because if you start, you'll already, I mean, there's no starting. Um, now, also, this is this is a fake company. I'm pretty sure that um, my coworker Celia set this up. So it's not every business that needs 100000 to start. There's a lot of businesses that maybe all you do need is a, is a website, and um, a business cards, especially if you're running out of your home, maybe you don't have rent. So maybe these are a lot lower, and that's okay. That's great, in fact. Um, but it's it's important to to look those up. Any questions before we move on from cash flow? Okay, we're still going to be talking about finance, though. So startup funds. So um, startup funds can be anything, and just like Christian said. It can include um, research before you actually open your business. Um, and so if you have equity, that's the money that you put in. And if you have the debt, you know, um, it's like a loan or a credit card. And it is okay if you are paying for some of this back here out of credit cards if you plan for it. You know, you don't want to be in the situation where you're having to, um, an emergency situation, max out credit cards for business startups. But if you have a plan in place that, okay, so I'm going to put this on my credit card, but then you'd have a credit card payment line here because you need to pay, you know, you need to pay those off. You need to at least make minimum payments. Um, in an instance, if you were sued. I'm not sure what you mean, Great. Oh, um, if you can finance a startup for your business, how... Do you make sure you can fund it and be personally removed from the ties of your business in an instance you were used to? That is when you'd want to most likely start at either an LLC or a corporation, depending on the other tax benefits that you want. Um, and like I said in the beginning, not only do you need to um, set it up there, but you need to keep them separate always. Um, and I don't know if you're talking about maybe starting one out of your home. We can talk about that in, in a minute. Um, let me get through a couple things. But if you tell, are you thinking about starting your business out of your home? Great. So we have, um, you know, whether you're paying for it out of the cash or with other debt, um, your equity options would be yourself, your savings account, um, maybe they're co-owners, maybe you have an investor or somebody that's going to go into the business with you. Um, if you're able to ask friends and family, that's a big thing for small business startups. Um, they're able to, and, and you can make, it doesn't have to be um, set any one way. They could be, your friends and family could become co-owners. They could become investors. It could be a loan. You guys can work that out um, however however it's comfor excuse me, comfortable with you. Um, angels are investors. It's kind of like Shark Tank. You guys know the show Shark Tank where you pitch and they input money. That would be an angel investor. Um, you can connect with those. There are networks like in Seattle and another big company or another um, 
the uh, metropolitan areas, um, but it's not like there's a ton of money out there. You know, you have to have your plan ready. Um, you have to show that you have really good projections and finances, and I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend talking to a coach or an advisor before going to pitch to angels. Um, you can also do crowdsourcing like Kickstarter, or Indiegogo, um, where you have m many, many people giving smaller amounts. That is a good. That is a definitely a viable option. It takes a lot of work. There's a lot of management that goes into that. Um, so just be aware aware of that. But we do have somebody on on staff that could help you. He kind of specializes in crowdsourcing. And then when it comes to debt. So it can be your personal credit. A lot of times for for startups, it comes down to a personal loan, personal credit card even. Um, you can apply for business loans. Most startups do not get funded with a business loan. Um, I mean, not all, it, unless you yourself have stellar credit. Um, and that and that sort of thing because big, banks are really risk adverse. And if you uh, if you can't show that you have the means to pay this off, um, they're gonna pass until you're until you're a couple years down the road. Now, when it comes to maybe opening a second location, expanding, buying new equipment, things like that, um, then yeah, they want to talk to talk to you again when you and then to say well I've been in, in business now for X amount of years clearly clearly we're doing well yada 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 they definitely don't want loan applications from people that are applying out of desperation if you're like oh crap let this is this is you only you weren't planning for this twenty thousand dollar deficit and now you're asking for money well, you've already proven to them that you are not a financial planner, right? You didn't plan. You're already six months in, and you need emergency money. They don't. They don't want to give it to you because how are you going to pay it back? You've already proven that you can't. So make sure that you are not hoping to do that as like a plan B. Um, SBA loans. SBA doesn't actually loan money, um, and the SBA is a small business administration, but they do guarantee business loans. So you'd go to uh, a bank that has an SBA loan program, and um, basically what happens is if you were to default on the loan, SBA would pay back a portion up to 80% to the bank um, so that the bank wouldn't lose all their money. So the SBA then, so on top of the bank looking at you, now also um, SBA will be looking at to make sure that you are um, a good bet to put to put um, some money into. Um, it's not necessarily, some people think, oh, well, it's going through the SBA and I am a small business, so it'll be easier. No, there's extra paperwork to fill out that loan application, but we can help with that. Um, there are also crowdsourcing options for debt, um, like um, prosper.com, for instance. Um, and that's where, again, so the crowdsourcing is where they give you um, a little bit of cash. This is they give you a little bit of, of credit or or loan type thing. Um, so business loans, really, these are based off of the six C's of credit. Um, this is what you pretty much need to have in order to get a business loan. And this is whether it's a business loan or an SBA business loan. Um, character, they say character, but really it boils down to credit score. Um, what is your personal credit score? Uh, capacity is like your skill and your plan. So do you have the, let's say for instance, Andrea, you wanted to start this, but you were not licensed to do that. Well, they say you don't actually have the capacity to run that business because you don't have that. Um, do you have the cash flow? Again, you'll need that projection. Um, the capital, most banks, especially if you are going to get a, a, a loan for a startup, you're going to have to put in 25 to 30%, generally speaking. Um, so, so plan for that it might be a little less if you're an established business, um, but you will have to put in some collateral. That's the bank's plan B. So this might be a place where your house is up for, you know, your house is collateral, or if you have something else, maybe you're getting a loan on equipment, the equipment would be the collateral. Um, and the conditions uh, is kind of the geography and the industry. So for instance, if you have the best, 
um, credit score and you had a great plan to open a Blockbuster, they're going to say, yeah, conditions aren't great for Blockbuster in America. Um, so, so be thinking about those things. Um, or maybe you want to open a high-end boutique in a low-income neighborhood. That's probably not going to be sustainable. Uh, so what about grants? We get that question all the time. Well, I've heard about grants for women or for minorities or um, yada, yada, yada. Nope, we, there aren't any money. And in Washington State, it's actually, um, it's actually in the law to uh, private money cannot pay for, or I'm sorry, public money cannot pay for private, private enterprise. Um, and really, when you think about it, this is all of our tax money. So uh, do you want our tax dollars to go help somebody open a bakery, somebody else open a private practice? Somebody, you know, is that where you want your, your tax money going? Um, not saying that they're not great people or that they'll be great businesses, um, but, you know, we want our money to go other places, roads and schools and, and that kind of thing. So free money does not exist. Grants. Uh, you can get some grants potentially if, um, let's say you were doing something innovative and you were developing like a new medical device. Um, the government has some, but it's so selective and it's so rare um, that. And I don't, nobody that told me anything on there, I don't think that they would be um, a candidate for an SBR grant. So unfortunately, no free money for women. Um, okay, so typical business plan program problems. We've really been, so I won't spend too much, except I will take some water here. Sorry, I've been talking too long. Um, so if it's not too in-depth, uh, you know, I told you before, you don't need to go into the history of the coffee bean, but you do need to go into some depth. You, you can't be too superficial. If there's too much data that's not relevant, <clears throat> you just wasted your time on on building that. Um, if you don't spend enough time building those um, or understanding your marketing demands, just by saying if I build it, they will come, doesn't work. You know, this isn't the field of dreams. Um, and even if word of mouth strategy is important, it takes a while to get off the board ground. You have to have a lot of customers in order for them to be word of mouth, right? So you have to have a marketing strategy before you can get to that point. Um, the financing plan, especially the cash flow, not detailed enough. That's a killer one for a lot of businesses. Um, and really the, the timing of the cost of activities um, not reflected in the cash flow. So again, be thinking about your business in the month to month, but also seasonally. How does it change? Um, so with all of that information, I know we're running 20 minutes over here, but we've kind of gone over those three. You guys might have more questions than when you started with, but hopefully they're at least pointed questions that you know, okay, these are the questions I need to think about in my business. These are the questions I need to plan for. And when you've done those, you'll have reached the question of, does the, do these line up? Is my business feasible? Um, what's next? I ha I'll be sending everybody this business coaching prep form. If you'd like to talk to Christine Buckley one-on-one, -on -one, again, Christine is our business coach, um, all I ask is that you fill that out with like some bullet points or short sentences, and we can get you scheduled on her calendar. Uh, that just helps us make sure that when we're spending time with you, uh, we're making it really efficient. Um, and that would be for one-on-one -on -one coaching. If you'd like more in-depth, if you like the webinar style, if you like the um, group training, Starting September 4th, there's an eight-week training called Best Business Enterprise Startup Training. It's every Tuesday from 9 to 11 uh, Pacific time. And it, there is a fee associated with that, but we do have scholarships available. So talk to me if you want to want to talk about a scholarship. And then these are some of our, our upcoming Let's Talk Business topics. I um, won't spend any time on those. I'll send that. This is the resource I've been promising you this whole time. So bizguy.wa.gov, and this will only be useful for the Washington State businesses. Um, this has information on planning your business, starting your business, business plans. It has templates. It goes more into de detail about those legal structures, so sole proprietor, LLC, corporation, yada, yada. Um, there's even a wonderful licensing wizard where you type in where you're starting your business, 
and um, what industry you're in, and it'll tell you some of the licenses you need. It'll help with hiring and payroll, um, and a lot more. It's a great, great, great resource. Um, and I'm sure that other states have something similar. Now let me go back. We're, um, go ahead. This is the end of the, the conversation here. Um, oh, Celia was the one who gave it with me last night. Um, you're welcome to, to reach out to her or to me. Uh, but let me go back and a answer Grace's question. And if you guys have any questions, uh, now's a great time to type it in. Okay. So finding it. Oh, no. Whose question was it? Oh, it was great. Okay. To make sure you can fund it. So you're going to be out of your house. Um, so what you would actually need to do is, even though you need to separate the house from you personally and your business, what you'd likely do is actually set up a lease, which will feel silly because you're leasing from yourself to yourself. Um, but you'd, the, your personal um, would be leasing to the business. And so you'd say, like, let's say you had a home office or maybe you have a studio or is it a mother-in-law building? Like, what is it? What's the square footage? What's the percentage? And you could actually then put a piece of your mortgage towards that as well as utilities as long as it's reasonable. It will not fly if you um, are paying your entire mortgage, all of your utilities, that sort of thing out of the business account. Will not fly. Um it's great, especially if you have like a separate building that can be tracked um, as far as utility uses separately. Um, that's great. I know that's not, not available for everybody. So yeah, you'd have to, okay, so one room in my three bedroom house, it's about this many square feet, yada, yada. You pull up a lease and then what you do is you pay your landlord, which would be you, <laughs> um, to do that because then that's a business expense and then that money that was paid go can go into your personal account and you can then use that to, to as a portion of the mortgage um, and that can really that really needs to go for any personal expenses except for or especially if you're working from home so um, but if you feel you need a car does that car also take you to pick up your kids from um, school or soccer, does it um, take you to go get ice cream and go grocery shopping? And Okay, so then you, if that's the case, you cannot say your entire car payment can come out of the business. Again, it needs to be like a reasonable estimate of the time you spent, or maybe instead um, you get, you, you charge mileage out of it. You know, you have to set something up so that you have those boundaries. And you need to always, always, always very diligently be following the rules that you set up. Because again, like you said, in the instance of where you're sued, if they see, um, if they see that the business has paid for your mortgage for the last three months, well, hello, the business, the house is now business property. They can make a claim for that. Um, same thing with a car or with, um, with excessive. Now, just because you're using your car for business use, maybe you're going to meeting, does not mean that you have to have that as a business um, expense or a business vehicle. You would still, you know, as employees, I obviously use my car to get to work. It's not a company car. Um, so, so just be really careful with that. And the separation is so important because it is tried under fire. You know, you're not going to get a Hey, the lawyer's not going to say, hey, I noticed you made this mistake. You should probably fix it before before I really sue the pants off of you. Nope, they're going to go for those vulnerable spots. Does that answer your question, Grace? I guess I mean that I can only put 10000 into my business account and use it for my... Oh, yes. So any cash you put in, um, that would be, you know, an... Um, uh, I'm thinking, blanking on the word. Yes, you can do that. Basically, that would be an owner contribution into the business. Absolutely. Because then that would be reflected into the equity of your business. Great question. Sorry. I answered a bunch of questions that weren't yours. Yes. Regardless of, of if it's a cash thing like that, you thought, you're, you know, I'm, spent, I'm putting $10,000 into my business account. This is how it's going to happen. Um, again, it needs to go through the business. There needs to be a transaction in your in your bookkeeping um, that shows that it's an owner contribution. Same thing if you draw. You don't just take the money out. It's an owner draw. 
you want to have the the trail for that. You just want to have the trail and you want it to come from the business in a way that um, that's appropriate. Were there any other questions? Okay, well, if you think of any, there's my email address, there's my personal line. Thank you so much for, I know I'm 25 minutes over here. It was a, a new slide deck and I overestimated how much time I had, but I appreciate everybody staying on. Um, and if you message me, I see a message about, New. oh, you're in New York. Okay, so if you're in any other state, feel free to message me and I will, I can get you the contact information for the um, Women's Business Center in that area. And just in, in just a second, I'll answer your question, Andrea. Um, but with that, have a great day, everybody.